Good morning, ladies and gentlemen, colleagues, friends. I would like to start with a congratulation uh, to, and congratulate you for making it in time on a Saturday morning that early. Um, congratulate you also because you made the right choice. Um, this will be an exciting workshop here and uh, we will be discussing as you can see, managing landscapes for the rural future. So a future-oriented approach to landscape management um, can only be successful if it is part or accompanied by an integrated territorial development approach. So in a broader perspective. And this event is hosted, as you can see, by the Federal Ministry for Economic Cooperation and Development, BMZ, and in cooperation with a whole range of partners whom you can see here. Uh, so it's CIRAT, not sure if you all know those abbreviations, it's the Center for International Cooperation on uh, Agri Ag uh, international uh, agri-economic research. Um, the FAO, I don't think I have to translate that, uh, the EU Commission and the OECD. And uh, we will have speakers from all the, those uh, <coughs> institutions. And I will introduce them uh, when they make their presentations. Allow me to introduce myself. I'm uh, Heino von Meyer. I'm heading the OECD office in Berlin, and uh, there I have to cover the whole range of OECD topics from education, PISA, to tax havens, but uh, I have a special interest in the topic that brings us together here, because in the early 90s I started my career at the OECD uh, by building up the Rural Development Program, and uh, I've also worked uh, for the EU Commission on these um, matters, and it's always been my concern to really see how we can help preserve biodiversity, but also cultural landscapes, and that in a way that it contributes to an integrated, uh, sustainable development of uh, rural communities. We will have four speakers and then a panel discussion, but let me mention, unfortunately, uh, this panel is uh, a bit biased towards the north because last minute really, uh, I think it was Thursday evening, uh, we got the message that an important panelist from Ethiopia uh, would not make it uh, to our uh, <coughs> meeting. Um, so unfortunately, it's a bit biased to the north, but uh, you, as you will see, the panelists have deep knowledge of what's going on in the South, in uh, Africa, and other places. And uh, our first speaker, the keynote speaker from BMZ, is an obvious example. Uh, Dr. Stefan Schmitz, whom uh, I would like to uh, come up to the podium and give his uh, <coughs> introductory speech. Stefan Schmitz is the Deputy Director General um, and also the commissioner of the One World No Hunger Initiative, ZEVO in German abbreviation, uh, which I think is a remarkable initiative by the German Development Cooperation Ministry. So for four, 15 years he is with BMZ now and has been leading the work on rural development, agriculture, food security, um, and actually I have to say this coming from the OECD, he also spent two years with the OECD uh, as a senior advisor. Uh, before he has covered uh, a lot of uh, jobs in the public administration, starting from statistical information systems to regional planning. Um, so clearly he covers and brings everything that's needed for uh, what we will discuss here. Uh, his background is uh, actually from Bonn University in geography 
and mathematics. Um, and he received a PhD in geoscience from the Free University of Berlin. So, Stefan, um, if you would give us your keynote opening uh, our discussions and then um, we will move on with the other speakers. Thank you very much. Um, hi, no, Heine von Meyer, for your, for your kind introduction. And uh, well, uh, thank, thanks to you that you made it that early on a Saturday morning from, uh, from, from Berlin to Bonn here. That uh, once again shows your strong commitment to, to the issue we are discussing, we are discussing today. Good morning, everybody, um, ladies and gentlemen, dear, dear colleagues. People do live in places, they do live in spaces, they live in territories, they do not live in sectors. Make that clear, and that is what we have to keep in mind, that it is all, all about. Territorial development is about the linkage between places and their environmental, social, political, cultural, and economic assets. It is about rural and urban places, and not to forget, and that is gaining even more important, uh, the continuum between the rural and the urban world. It is also about the functionality of places to secure the livelihood of people. Ultimately, participation and democracy happens in territories, in spaces. There are individual interests, stakeholder interests, in particular sectors. But when it comes to democracy participation, it is a place where things come all together. Territories and landscapes fulfill a broad range of functions for the rural population and beyond. They have a crucial role to play in the context of a broader uh, development. SDGs are the yardstick to measure the success of global development. And again, SDGs are interconnected, and we will only be able to reach the SDGs if we see them as a system that is interconnected. There are so many cross benefits we have to keep in mind, and we have to and, and we have to work on. They have to include answers to the global trends of climate change, urbanization, migration, and the tremendous and fast transformation of the rural space, in particular in Africa. We have to leave the comfort zone to create opportunities for young people. We have to think out of rigidly framed sectoral policies with isolated interventions, taking up a more holistic and territorial perspective for development. Yes, and it is on social issues. It is on people here. We have, first and foremost, we have to bridge these two worlds. On the one hand, our concern for the resources of the planet, and on the other hand, the concern for the people living today and the generations uh, to come. This is not a call to reorganize our institutions or systems, but a call to find ways to remove our sectoral blinders and overcome some of our self-made barriers to inclusive and sustainable development. A territorial pers perspective is what can help us in this regard. And I mean, even you and we all in this room, we should be very frank, how open are we to look beyond our day-to-day -day business. I know that many of you come from, have a climate background, work on forests, some of you on, on soils, other on dryland ecologies. We have to start bringing these aspects together as a starting point, and there is still, still a lot to do. This is a time to foster much stronger territorial perspectives for development. 
but it's encouraging to see that the debate about territories and landscapes is gaining momentum, strong momentum right now. Multisectoral and multi-stakeholder approaches appear as a more appropriate framework for addressing the complexity of structural transformation. And there are really encouraging examples. For, for example, the CFS, the World Committee on Food Security, um, there are now discussions about territorial food systems. That's a good way. There are guidelines on urban rural linkages spearheaded by UN Habitat. The Rural Policy 3.0 by OECD highlighting the importance of a place-based view on rural development. And finally, the White Paper on Fostering Territorial Perspectives for Development. A group of development partners, BMZ and GIZ from uh, Germany, CIRAD, EU, FAO, all of them elaborated it, some of which are here today. These are just a few examples. I've seen uh, copies around here, perhaps. Yeah, they're already circulated, but keep that in mind. Very interesting, uh, very interesting papers. A territorial approach to development aiming at coherence and integration. It embraces rural, sectoral, and national, uh, national policy objectives. It fosters coordination across levels of governance to localize development strategies and builds on collaboration between the public and private sectors and communities. And that is another aspect by thinking about bringing things together. Most of the time we think either of, okay, how, how, to, how to strengthen institutions, yeah, have a strong view on, on, on the public sphere. And then other people think a lot on public-private partnership, private sector um, development and so, but we have to bridge this as well as a, as a whole universe that can link and should link uh, the public and the private sphere. The ultimate success factor of territorial development from my perspective is good rural governance. To make very clear that it is not ultimately, not the question of the right techniques we have. No, it is a question of political will and the transformation of political will through institutions into a political reality. There are four, four ingredients, at least, to a rural governance. First of all, it's decentralization of, of power, of power, of, of money, of uh, implementation capa uh, capacities from national down to regional and local level. Second point, very complement to this, there needs to be empowerment of people, bottom up, starting from the, from, uh, from the local uh, level. Third point, so I would say rural governance in a narrower sense is what we are talking about, place-based policies connecting various aspects. And last but not least, legal security with regard to tenure of land for agriculture, forestry, natural con uh, nature conservation, infrastructure development, and the use of water resources. And I have the, well, what comes to my mind are the voluntary guidelines uh, the, for the governance and tenure of land. They are the compass for what needs to be, Every, everything is in it. Everything in it what really uh, needs to be done with that regard. And to make all these four aspects happen, ultimately I said, okay, political will is needed and the strengthening of institutions. We need stronger institutions who can make that happen. And that starts from capacity development uh, within organizations that has a lot to do with data, statistics, information systems and goes to empowerment of, of people uh, on, on various uh, levels.
to realize rural governance, we need adequate platforms that allow the negotiation and prioritization of national policies and at the same time decide on local measures with expected outcomes. I'm glad that we have speakers in the side event today who are passionate about holistic and integrated territorial approaches. With them, we want to discuss and learn what it takes to put territorial approaches into practice and prepare the ground uh, for action. It's time for territorial approaches. Thank you very much. Thank you, Stefan, for this introduction and uh, encouraging us to really think beyond boundaries. Um, also, thank you for staying within the very tight time regime we have to uh, comply with. Um, but I think you managed to get the key messages across. Um, it is people who don't live in sectors but in territories, in landscapes, that designs the area in which they organize action and also decision making um, in a democratic uh, way. And that clearly relates very closely to the issue of good governance. And I think we'll come back to the issue of good rural governance as a precondition for enabling, empowering, and uh, nonetheless, this needs to be based on concrete evidence, data, and uh, we will therefore, in our first intervention by, um, to this discussion, the thematic input number one will be on territorial foresight, and uh, we will see methodologies to support collective thinking as a preparation for collective action, and the speaker will be Jean-Michel Sorisso from uh, <coughs> CIRAT, and uh, I tried it earlier, it's the Center for International uh, <coughs> Agricultural Research for Development. I, at the end of this meeting, I will be uh, fluent and maybe even express it in French. But uh, Jean-Michel, he doesn't like it, but uh, his background is in biochemistry. Yeah? You would not expect a person like this uh, to be really engaged uh, in empowering the Kanak uh, communities in New Caledonia. So you see the spectrum of what he is covering. Um, he deals much more now with the eco economics and the socio-political uh, <coughs> dynamics in um, rural and landscape approaches. He started after his PhD to work on large-scale uh, irrigation systems in the west of Africa, in Senegal, and in Mali. And still, although large-scale, his interest is very much in family farming and how these smallholder farmers are forced to look for other activities outside the perimeter of the farm. So pluriactivity and multifunctionality of agriculture are topics he is uh, dealing with. And I think he is much better placed to tell you how to bring together these various dimensions. So Jean-Michel, we really look forward to your intervention. Please. <coughs> Thank you very much for this uh, presentation, Mr. You're not used to that, but it's good. And uh, thank you for the biochemistry and stuff. You know. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I've got a, uh, a PowerPoint there. If it's, yeah. So I wanted to share with you uh, work we did on behalf of the French Agency for Development, uh, AFD. Uh, it was a work we, uh, we implemented in Sego in uh, Mali and in uh, Vakinankavach area in, uh, in uh, Madagascar. And uh, the idea is to, well, to relocalize uh, strategic decisions and um, policies uh, at the territorial level. So it's a territorial perspective 
that we want to introduce in uh, policy uh, uh, design. Just to, to begin some principle, but uh, uh, Schmidt uh, has already set the, the scene, but uh, we wanted to, to be clear that the forest territory is uh, first of all a space of governance for human activity uh, where future projects, program and policies are conceived and implemented. So that's the, 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 the thing. For us, it begins, of course, by multi-stakeholder, participatory, of course, uh, diagnosis and, uh, and analysis. That's also uh, a fact. And for us, the opposition between uh, uh, sectorial policies and multi-sectorial policies, and that's uh, the, the, the fact there. Multi-sectorial policies are there for facilitating, facilitating, in fact, sectorial policies. But we will um, um, go back on this, uh, I think, in the, in, in the whole side event. We are not working at uh, only one scale, but at all the relevant scale for action within the territories. So it's not a, a unique uh, space-based uh, uh, work. And of course, we think that it's in the opposition between landscape and uh, territory is not, it, we have to go beyond that. And we think that um, finally, inter an integrated landscape management plus socioeconomic uh, issues we mentioned are necessary to think development and the use of, uh, of natural resources. And we also really strongly believe that development strategy should be encored to specific territorial assets and should rely on in interdependency between places. So uh, the thing I wanted to share with you, this methodological um, proposal, uh, start from a dynamic diagnosis of the territory um, trajectory, strengths and risk. And we propose a, a very completed and articulated uh, methodology to do that. Uh, we implemented first uh, a very classical um, territorial diagnosis, very classical but not so easy because we have to uh, gather and to collect the data at territorial level, which is quite difficult. In fact, we have data at national level. It's much more difficult to have data at territorial level, and this is really an effort we have to do uh, uh, for, the, for the future. We complemented this broad uh, diagnostic analysis by a specificity characteristic that we want to introduce is to project our reflection into the future to help us to think the present. I will go back for, for that. So the question that, what do we know about the future? And in this specific uh, area, we, um, we focused on demographic uh, uh, prospect and demographic issues that are really tough and very uh, strategic uh, in uh, sub-Saharan uh, Africa. I won't present all the results of the, of the diagnosis, but I want to stress this particular question of, uh, of demography. When we look at uh, the very territorial level, this is the region of, uh, of Segu in Mali, and this was the density of population uh, in 1987, villages per villages. And this was the situation in the last uh, population census that we can use in 2009. And what you see is that there is a huge uh, uh, increase of population, but this, this increase of population is not concentrated to cities, it's concentrated everywhere. So we have a, a rural densification which is occurring because of this demographic push. And this really questions the way you address uh, sectorial areas and the way you address uh, resource management. This uh, density is very uh, uh, one of the first results. Second things, we want to relate uh, the demographic challenge to the job challenge at territorial level. And there, the, the, the numbers are really impressive. We had 1.5 million people in the Segu uh, area in 1993. Uh, there will be 4.6 million in uh, 235, even if some will leave, the, 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 the demographic push is there. When you translate that in new commerce on the labor market every year, there were uh, 38,000 young people entering the labor market in 2015. There will be 64,000 in uh, 2038, uh, 35, sorry. So this means that between 2015 and 2035, we will have to create in the only, in the single region of Segu, more than 1 million uh, jobs, which is very tough and which once again Requestion the, the sectorial approaches we have to do implement and the, the natural resources um, strategies we have, we have to do. The numbers are less impressive in Madagascar, but still very impressive. 
So uh, back to the methodology, we have this diagnostics and this projection, and we complemented once again this uh, uh, work to relocalize uh, strategic decision with two other uh, modules in our methodology. Surveys, because uh, national and uh, official data don't, uh, are not sufficient uh, to, to understand, and we have to put some fresh also in, the, in this data. So we implemented uh, surveys, household surveys, about their livelihood, but also about the way they project themselves into the future. What do they imagine for their children and so on. I don't have time also to, uh, to, to describe this, but it's very important, the discrepancy between what we imagine for the future and what the household uh, leaders and what the children and the elder people think about the, the, the future, very interesting. And last module of our methodology, uh, we implemented a territorial foresight uh, through participatory multi-stakeholder uh, workshops. In two words, what does that mean? Is that we selected with a lot of people some key and relevant drivers uh, that should explain the evolution of the territory uh, in the future. Then with the people, we imagine different evolution of all these uh, key uh, uh, drivers. There in the Stego region, we have eight major uh, drivers of change. So we imagine some evolution of these drivers and we put it all together to imagine different scenario for the future. In each region we worked, uh, we imagined eight scenario uh, per, per region. This is one, so uh, I won't describe, but uh, security was important, uh, uh, energy, uh, informal sector activity, and so on. So we imagine how the territory would move, and so to have an image of the, uh, of the future. So we are at these steps, and now we will implement the other things, is the, the implementation and the policy design, really, of the, the, this policy. And for this, we plan to also have a series of modules, not only single uh, way to entrance. We think it's important to have territorial development uh, monitoring and evaluation in continue, produce data that are specifically uh, uh, targeting the stake of the territory you are working in, and this is important. Data uh, issues, it's really strategic. That has been said, but I want really to insist on that. We need to adjust also the representation of the people uh, from the, of the future. Uh, time to from time to time is quite important. And we have to implement what we call backcasting. So starting from the futures we imagine, we go back from step to step to the present to reframe what's the vision of the present and what should be done. And then with all this stuff, this diagnostics, the, the, the monitoring and evaluation system, uh, the projection to the future and the backcasting exercise, we should design uh, policy design uh, policies place-based uh, uh, place, place and so on. So to conclude and to stay in the, in, in the time, I hope for us, territorial perspective in development really is the way to integrate, an, uh, to have an integrated approach to define a more effective sectorial policies. Once again, is to have a frame, a general frame on territorial to be able to think and to adjust uh, how a sectorial policies. It's not a fight between territorial and sectorial policies, it's the way to manage them uh, more precisely. The thing of the future, anticipation, foresight, for us it's very important, especially when it's, the situation is very tense, when the, the, the relationship with the actors, with the stakeholders are very tense. If you imagine what's gonna happen in the future, it's much more easier to speak with the people and the, 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 the smart the, of the, the conversation is much more high. So our idea is to imagine the future, to help to understand the present and perhaps to play on the desirable future we want to, uh, to, to, to achieve. And at stake now, it's implementation. And just to finish, two points of advertisement. You've got also one small paper that go uh, uh, a bit in deep uh, of what I've told now. And there's also a book in French uh, that you can find on the, on the website of the French uh, Agency Development. Thank you very much. Yes, thank you, Jean-Michel. Um, I think it became very clear that, yes, you talked about data, but not in the traditional technocratic top-down logic, but building up data for evidence which enables and empowers a discourse of people about their future. And so uh, it is really a way of uh, organizing um, bottom-up 
um, ideas. And I think it was very impressive to see what you called rural densification, because we tend to have that picture. People are moving from the rural to the urban, and so <coughs> I think your picture clearly gave an impression of the urgency that we have to even create jobs in rural areas and find livelihoods um, <coughs> because the future of uh, these young people in the rural areas cannot only be to migrate maybe to the next town, the next big metropolitan area, or even beyond. So I think it shows the urgency of actually addressing this issue of massive increases in population in rural areas, which create then conflicts with a natural uh, resource base, with the environment, etc. So I think we'll come back to these uh, <coughs> issues, but, <coughs> sorry, um, our next speaker uh, will really come from a very global perspective. It is uh, Jordan Trickle from the FAO. At the FAO, he is uh, working with on rural institutions and social policies. And for the past 10 years, he has um, worked on issues of territorial development, strengthening producer organizations, and rights-based <coughs> land governance issues, really from Africa uh, to Southeast Asia, even Europe and North America. Uh, North America, because he is from the US uh, from North Carolina, but uh, he chose to study rural sociology in Wacheningen and uh, also for some time coming from Berlin. Uh, he worked also in Berlin and he is now based in Italy and uh, he just told me he, he loves uh, Rome. It's a bit chaotic, but uh, that's what we have to cope with. And I think uh, in rural development, people say, oh, it's so complex and uh, it's very difficult to get a hands-on. I'm sure you will get a hands-on and uh, maybe uh, please come up and give us your presentation. Thank you. It's so quiet here. Maybe <laughs> you Thank you for that kind introduction and, and warm welcome. Good morning. Uh, my name is Jordan Treacle. I'm coming from FAO. And I would like to spend uh, a few minutes this morning introducing you all to uh, one of FAO's territorial development approaches called participatory negotiated territorial development. Uh, so, uh, or PNTD for, for short. So PNTD uh, is a process oriented methodology that uh, FAO developed uh, through a participatory process with stakeholders uh, in 2005 following the International Conference on uh, Agrarian Reform in Brazil and going through a, a critical self-reflection on the failures of, um, or the common failures of traditional top-down technocratic approaches to uh, policy formulation and, and program uh, implementation. Um, and it was through this process of reflection that um, it was clear that there was a, a clear need to refocus putting marginalized stakeholders at the center of development processes, not only as beneficiaries, but actual drivers of, of development in, in their local communities and landscapes. Um, and, and there was a belief, in, and, and we've seen through implementing this over the past 15 years, that this kind of approach really does strengthen the social legitimacy um, and social cohesion of, of territories and ultimately, we believe, leads to a stronger and more sustainable uh, lasting impacts of, of these policies and programs over the long term. Um, so we've used this, this, um, this approach both in policy formulation and program development. And uh, at the core, we use uh, these definitions of territories and governance systems, which, you, which I'm happy to see very much reflect some of the, the, the definitions that have been used so far this morning. We see territories very much as social political arenas 
um, linked to geographies, which host the interac interactions among actors and their ecosystems. And it's the governance systems, the rural governance systems, that mediate the, inter the interests and relations within this territory and shape those relationships and interactions with, with the ecosystems. Um, so I don't, I don't have time to go through all of the, the in depth, these key components and principles of this methodology, but um, they again echo many of the many other principles and, and components mentioned already. We focus on uh, leading a, a bottom up approach, a participatory process, particularly focusing on marginalized stakeholders who traditionally are excluded from these kinds of governance processes. Um, we strive to be multi-sectoral and, and multi-level governance approach, so linking these processes at the community level with um, national level um, institutions. Um, and, and again, putting the rights-based approach and, and people at the center of this process. Ultimately, we find that through, these, through this approach, we're, we're trying to address the power asymmetries that um, are often seen, particularly among smallholders and, and business interests, and facilitate a process of dialogue and negotiation where these different stakeholders can represent their own interests and, and visions for the development in, in, the, in their territories. Um, so this, this is a response, as, as, as we all know, to common challenges of weak natural resource governance structures. This is both we see in the de developed and developing world where uh, the formal governance structure, structures often don't carry um, significant social legitimacy and this weakens their implementation. Um, we mentioned already the high asymmetry of power between different stakeholders. Um, in many cases where we work, we see legal plurality where there's a formal governance structures that are not in line with custom, the customary governance structures and, and customary institutions, uh, which oftentimes causes conflict, particularly in a context of investment, foreign investment. Um, and finally, gender disparities is, is quite common. I think we're all familiar with that, but we see this as a detriment to sustainable development over the long term and, and foods. Uh, a driver of food insecurity in many contexts. So um, without going through the entire, without the methodology, I'd like to, to, to hit on three issues. One is that um, a core component of this approach is investing in the analysis process. Um, and I, I was quite pleased to see um, that Sierra takes a very similar approach of trying to invest in identifying stakeholders who are not um, usually um, consulted or engaged in the formulation of policies or the implementation of programs. So that's a long-term uh, process. It takes a lot of time and resources, but is critical for the outcome of any kind of negotiation uh, when it's implemented to be sustainable. Um, the second piece is capacity development. Um, identifying stakeholders um, and trying to engage them, oftentimes these stakeholders do not have the, the, the capabilities or, or knowledge, technical know-how to represent um, their interests adequately in a, in a process of negotiation um, and, and dialogue. So we, um, in order to be rights-based, we, we uh, invest significant time and resources in strengthening the capacities um, of those marginalized stakeholders. And then the third, and it's certainly most complex and, and time intensive, is creating this forum in which the different stakeholders can, to, can come together um, and engage in this process of dialogue and negotiation. And in doing that, trying to level the playing field and, and address those asymmetries of power. Um, so we do this with a common, with a, with a common approach of multi-stakeholder platforms, um, which of course have to be adapted to the particular territory um, um, uh, but that's the, that's the mechanism or method that we commonly use for this step. Um, so with the, with the few minutes I have left, I just want to give a, a, put a little bit of meat on the bones of this theoretical um, discussion and talk about one of the programs that we've been implementing for some time um, in Angola. Um, FBO started working in Angola in the late 1990s as Angola was uh, emerging from 27 years of civil war. 
Um, and this is working in a, in a context of a significant uh, displacement from, from the conflict, um, uh, significant damage to agricultural infrastructure, um, a lack of a clear natural resource governance framework, and at, really at a societal level, a lot of uh, trust and fear coming from, from this legacy of, of, of war. Um, so FAO was asked to come in and support the government in the implementation of its land law, uh, which was which uh, in, in the early 2000s, which was then uh, again amended in 2004. Um, and so the, the first entry point in developing this working relationship with the Angolan government was supporting the, the government in building its, its rural institutions and mapping its natural resource inventory. So, so this data piece was, was critical as a first step to see uh, the context in which we were working. And through that process, we were also able to start uh, the process of identifying stakeholders that we would later um, work with. Um, the second piece was the um, development or formulation of this community land delimitation methodology. And this was an effort specifically to acknowledge that the uh, customary land tenures uh, continues to be important in Angola, but it was uh, these customary land rights were system, uh, continuously being ignored um, or, or not recognized. And this was an uh, uh, important driver of conflict, particularly as outside investment was coming into Angola, um, particularly in the fossil fuel and diamond sectors. Um, so with that process of developing um, this methodology, we would then we did then implemented a series of, of workshops at community um, and national level, uh, working with technicians and local government staff and CFO, CSOs on um, the, the the components and principles of the new land law and the pr this process of uh, implementing this community delimitation um, program. And then we facilitated the actual implementation of the program itself. Um, so this is a title. So, so th through this process, and I won't go through all the steps, but we started working with the, with the San community, which is a, a minority community that historically had um, been marginalized, their, their community land rights ignored, and we put them at the center of this project of, of delimitating their, their land rights. So we would work with customary um, institutions, local chiefs, uh, local government, um, um, and, and outside investors to recognize and actually geo-reference the, the, the borders between different communities and try to facilitate this process of building trust in those new boundaries of those of those laws and the, of those boundaries, and then formalizing them in the cadastres that we were working with the government to build. So this is the first sand community land title that was issued in 2006. Um, the more recent example is in 2014. Uh, we basically were able to build up uh, the local institutions and civil society to lead this process. So we were able to uh, to sort of step back from the facilitation. Um, and this is another land title that was uh, mapped and, and then given to the local community without FAO's direct involvement. So we saw this as a process of sort of sustainably handing over this process to actors in the country. And um, sort of the next steps out of this specific program in, in Angola, we have moved increasingly away from the land tenure piece into the natural resource management discussion. So trying to find ways to work, particularly with the farmer field school uh, programs um, to strengthen the technical capacities of these communities, investing in, in uh, practices like agroecology um, and addressing land conflicts, particularly with uh, investment and out, uh, with outside investors. Um, we have a, a working paper that I think we'll have access to on the, on the website that gives more details about this particular case um, in Angola, as well as a detailed uh, paper on the methodology, um, the PNT methodology, so we can see in more detail all the steps that I briefly went over today. So thank you very much. Well, thank you, Jordan. Um, 
I think many people still think these international global organizations, they can only think top down. Um, I think your presentation made it clear um, at least some people think differently in these big machines. And I think the organizers of the workshop here probably thought that they were opposing uh, perspectives here, the top-down FAO perspective with a bottom-up um, perspective coming from um, an NGO perspective. I guess we will see that these perspectives aren't that different and that we should rather think about how do we bring them together in a productive manner. So our third thematic input will be from uh, Sarah Sher. She is the president and CEO and actually founder of Eco Agriculture Partners in the US, but I think here you are probably more with uh, your other hat as chair of Landscapes for People, Food and Nature, an initiative which uh, she is very active in and I think which brings her uh, also here being a key figure in the uh, Global Landscape Forum. Um, she is engaged in promoting global cross-sectoral analysis, knowledge sharing, collaborative approaches, and uh, so her speech will be very much about capacity building uh, at the landscape level to support territorial development. She uh, has a background as an in international economics and development from Cornell, um, where she did her masters and both and her PhD. And I will not go through her long list of uh, roles she had in uh, an impressive uh, CV. Many positions. Uh, I will cite just a few: director of ecosystem services. Um, at Forest Trends, she also worked at IFPRI, the International Food Policy Research Institute, um, and uh, at the World Agroforestry Center. I'll stop here, a long list, but uh, I think it's always been about the same issue, empowering people, organizing uh, initiatives to not just preserve the landscape, but designing living landscapes uh, where people have also livelihoods um, and we really look forward to your intervention. Please, Sarah. Good morning, everyone. It's really a pleasure to be here with this, this group of people here and to follow the speakers who provided the perfect background for what I'm going to talk about today. Um, Eco Agriculture Partners was started in 2002, and part of the stimulus for it was both the need for integrating these sectors uh, that was, was clear from the science that I had been involved with, with before and my colleagues, um, but also, you know, there's this, all these really cool agricultural innovations and natural resource management innovations, and it was like, there's just so much potential here to transform landscapes in the directions of, of sustainability across, across the goals. Um, one of the things we very quickly realized as we started to become grounded and learn about all these many, many landscape initiatives that were coming up from the reality that people were living in landscapes and in territories was that the landscape is a socio-ecological process. And so we can't be talking just about the management pieces. We can't be talking about the technical pieces. It is fundamentally about a transformation in what is happening in people's heads and in people's institutions and in their capacity to interact fruitfully among their institutions and, and among their groups. And so what I wanted to talk about, it's the cultural changes. What I wanted to talk about is that although we clearly need to do much more in the formal sector education realm and institutions need to train their staff in some of these new techniques that were just discussed here before, um, what I want to focus on today is the capacity building of the people working in the landscape who have to work together, where the majority of the learning that takes place is going to be action learning, 
the things that they are doing while they are trying to implement these programs, and to provide moments and opportunities for people to reflect collectively on what they are learning together, and seeing this really as a collective enterprise. We'll you wanna, can, do I do this or do you? Can you do through the next slide? Where's my, is it this Q thing? Okay, this is a picture of a, of a landscape that shows all these different actors that are working in it, all these different interactions that are gonna lead to different sustainable development goals by, by, by working together. Achieving landscape regeneration requires synergistic action among all these different sectors and all these different social groups. The focus is actually on improving the interaction among them, spatially, sectorally, et cetera, uh, at, different, at different levels. Um, it, we, we, what we require is widespread capacities to do integrated landscape management, not that the, 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 the special sort of heads of organizations are good at this or specialized agencies. Hundreds of thousands of people need to be shifting the way they're working to, in these kind of directions. Yet it is true that currently most of our institutions, our governing institutions, our uh, governments, our educational institutions, our uh, work is so highly sectorialized. People are not trained to think in terms of landscapes and how the specialized information that they have is relevant to a larger landscape issue. So what I wanted to talk about today is how do we accelerate this kind of learning and what we have observed in the field about four particular um, instruments or particular tools that we think are actually quite useful um, at, at, at uh, making this happen at a practical level. And what I'm making a pitch here today is for people to think of this not as a nice thing to do on the side of your major investment programs in landscapes and territories, but as the central enabling process that will actually lead to implementation. And these are pretty simple things. They're not very expensive things. And I think it'd be great to see a more investment going into these on, at, 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 at every level. So let me um, move first to the first of these four, which is about landscape leadership development. It is centrally important in any particular landscape to have 20, 40, 50, 100 people, maybe 150 people in that landscape, farmer organization leaders, enterprise and business leaders, government leaders in the local uh, government and the national government representatives who might be uh, there, uh, the head of the protected area network, all of the key people who are involved in this relationship between people and uh, resources in the landscape you need leadership among them and they need to be moving in the same broad direction. So the kind of example that Jordan was giving here, how do you get this cadre of leaders, not in the political sense, but in, a, in, in the sense that they are influential and can help mobilize action among people. For them to learn how to develop a method of distributed leadership. It's not like the head of the territorial initiative. It's like who are the 25 groups the coalition, not necessarily even a formal coalition, but a coalition that's all gonna be moving around a similar vision of where the landscape is going to go, what are the strategies you're gonna pursue, have identified the potential trade-offs and synergies, talked them through, looked at how programs would need to be designed, how investments would need to be designed, public, private, so that it'll move in those directions. That is a really difficult task to do. And the people who are doing it are heroes, in my view, and they are wonderful and deserve our support. But it's really not enough to just say, yay, you're doing a great job. They really need help. And one of the things that we've done at Eco Agriculture Partners since 2006 have been developing methodologies for landscape leadership development, workshops and trainings and long-term engagement uh, around their to broaden their own understanding of the landscapes, to talk explicitly about how do you manage multi-stakeholder platforms, how do, you, how do you move folks, understanding themselves well enough to know where their limitations and vision are and how they can learn from one another and create an opportunity where you're actually creating in microcosm the kinds of interactions that you're going to need to see over the long term. Uh, and they have to be face to face with these people from other sectors and explain themselves and, and learn themselves. So that's the, probably for me, the number one most impactful and influential thing, and I don't know why we're not investing massively in it. Second um, item 
And the second tool is, is it actually isn't enough to just have good attitudes and good vision and good commitment. There is actually a need for very specific tools. And we've already seen today a couple of the kinds of tools that are very explicit toward landscapes. Um, they, they need to have tools that work effectively, that are inclusive, and that actually catalyze and accelerate these collaborative processes that are, that are needed in landscapes. Now, um, there are many actors that are doing tools. Eco Agriculture Partners, I was shocked to realize, has developed 27 different tools uh, for integrated landscape management. And I do want to give a little advertisement. You can see at the Inclusive Landscape Finance Pavilion, uh, we have cards where you can see we've, we've got uh, uh, 12 of them that we've identified that we think are particularly good. Um, and they they're really help lubricate this process. They're, most of them are highly participatory, and even the sophisticated ones just use technical experts as advisors to the leaders, not as the groups that are leading the process. And uh, we have everything from landscape performance scorecard, where as part of the assessment process, people figure out what's working well and what isn't, and exchange that information among different sector, you know, sector uh, leaders. Uh, another one that is uh, participatory scenario modeling, uh, where again, it builds on what we were hearing before in terms of laying out what, are, what is the outcome on the sustainable development goals we're gonna have if we pursue different scenarios in this landscape a valuable tool to help the planning process and really move it forward much more quickly than in traditional systems. A third really cool one is the Landscape Investment and Finance Toolkit to help landscape initiatives that have an action plan on what the collaborators are doing. How do you translate that into something that you can actually get investment in? So let me move on then to the third tool. The, whoa, <laughs> I'll get that later. Um, the third tool is that these leaders do need long-term support, not from people like us. They need it from their peers. They really desperately want to be able to, sh to discuss with others who are facing the same kind of difficulties of running a multi-stakeholder platform or developing a payments for ecosystem service that brings farmers and environmentalists together. Um, they want face-to-face. The digital stuff is wonderful, we're great supporters of it, but what people want when you ask them, they want the chance to sit down and have a conversation with somebody else who's facing the same challenges in the kind of work that they're doing. Mentoring, cross-site field visits, um, internships with other organizations, topical workshops on things they're really struggling with. Can they share those things and have them identify the agenda? So one of the things that we've been, we've been trying to facilitate and provide some backstopping for are these leader-led landscape uh, networks. And some of these have been set up in Kenya, in Ethiopia, in Tanzania, um, some now starting in Mesoamerica. There's already some great uh, networks that have been established in Mesoamerica among indigenous communities. Uh, women's, a new women's group, just um, multi-country women's group about how do you improve gender. Is it all done? Okay. Um, anyway. Fourth item, it's really valuable to, ha to have these regional, whoop. well, not sure why that's not going. Ah, there we go. Well, it seems to be messy. Anyway, let me go on to just say there's regional uh, centers and regional get-togethers of these leaders so they can learn in a much more, in a more formal setting, a more explicit knowledge sharing setting. And there have been two great models of this in Africa in 2014 and 2017 that the Landscapes for People, Food and Nature Initiative partners developed the agenda themselves, brought in the items that were important to them, shared tools. Um, there's a, also a one that was done this year in Mesoamerica and a huge desire to see this replicated again in 2019. We'll be having these regional dialogues were there. So my last word is to just reiterate that although the, the formal education and development part is critical for the future of integrated landscape management, it's the support for action and learning in a more systematic way that I think is one of the things we need to look for in terms of implementation. Thank you. Oh, okay. okay. Well, thank you, Sarah. Um, also for the time discipline, um, we're really fully in time. Um, I would now like to ask the uh, speakers to come up to the podium, plus one figure uh, person we have not yet 
uh, identified and uh, he is from the European Union, the only organization still missing here. Uh, so please come up and uh, we will have a short round of panel discussion here on the panel and later on uh, we will open for discussion with you. Please. We have not arranged the seating, but uh, since also not only are we biased to the north, uh, we also, our gender balance isn't the best one, so maybe, uh, Sarah, if you stay in the middle and... Uh, <laughs> Patrick, would you come next to me? Because uh, I'll introduce uh, Patrick Harland from the European Commission. He is working in uh, DG DEFCO, the um, <coughs> Director General dealing with international cooperation. And uh, he is engaged and responsible for rural development issues, food systems, territorial approaches. In his d description, he doesn't say territorial development. Uh, or rural development, he calls it inclusive rural transformation. Um, and I think that uh, gives it already uh, a certain angle how he would approach the things. Um, he's also dealing with sustainable food systems and he co-chairs the global platform for rural development. He's worked also in a lot of countries, uh, Tunisia, Armenia, uh, in the Balkans, uh, also in Haiti and in Bolivia. So I will not go through all of that, but again, uh, I think we have an impressive uh, panel with people who know about the world and therefore my statement that we are biased, uh, I think, uh, is balanced because they really bring also local experience. But uh, back to the EU Commission. Um, Maybe, Patrick, from what you've heard, does that fit to your daily life in Brussels? Um, isn't it difficult in the Commission to uh, argue for such a broad um, territorial approach to uh, development and landscape management? Thank you. If the colleagues could manage the microphones here. Okay, yeah, now it's okay, on. <laughs> So thank you for having me. Uh, I'm very honored to be and pleased to be in this room with so many uh, audience and uh, also benefiting from all the presentations from this morning. Uh, yes, indeed, for uh, the European Commission, it's, it's, uh, it's quite a, a tough job to, to add another layer, let's say, another interpretation, another perspective to the kind of work we're trying to, to fulfill. Um, for DEFCO, at least, uh, we have very central this idea of inclusive rural transformation, of uh, sustainable agricultural transformation, mobilizing essentially the small-scale small family farming, and also the idea of densifying urban-rural linkages, what, which was indicated by, uh, by Jean-Michel. And then lately, we're thinking about this uh, idea of sustainable agri-food systems as kind of bigger framework in which we then can localize our different interventions, uh, both in food security, nutrition, and, and research, and so on, innovation. Um, all this is also linked to a way of working, of course. We always go through multi-stakeholder uh, consultation processes, then leading to uh, multi-sectoral challenges, and automatically then uh, reaching the conclusion that we will have to territorialize at some point uh, this kind of work. Another big challenge is, of course, as we have been working in the past, mainly through sectoral approaches, we, will, we would like to consolidate and even strengthen those sectoral results and sectoral achievements. Uh, it's not about, like Jean-Michel also and Chen and, and Sarah said, it's not about changing things, but just adding and complementing, strengthening. There are big challenges in this territorial approach also, but we think that um, the territorial approaches will help us solve one of the big challenges, is the, the distribution between public goods and private goods. Because in a territory, you will have to decide, or actors will have to decide, which will be public goods, which will be provided by the public sector, and which will be better provided by the private sector. This is a theme that, that still is bothering us, because we are, of course, um, 
trying to stimulate growth, sustainable growth, employment, and all these other objectives that were also pointed out by previous speakers. And then uh, it's also the question of, yes, um, how can we guide the private sector? How can we stimulate the private sector so it delivers those public goods or creates a creating a framework for these public goods to be, be delivered at territorial level? So these are other challenges that once we have decided on taking a, a territorial perspective, how go further and to move into how create growth, how to create employment, how to, it's not about just managing the resources, we know these boundaries exist, but then the bigger challenge is the development challenge. Okay, well, thank you. I see he has a long list. If I <laughs> allow him to go on, uh, <laughs> the others will not get into the picture. However, uh, one further question. I mean, it's nice to think about these concepts of uh, transformative uh, development um, in an EU commission in Brussels. But in the end, you have to convince national governments because you cannot bypass them and interact Im directly with the local level. I mean, even within Europe, where we have a common agricultural policy, when the commission tried to uh, approach local communities in the leader program, the national administrations would say, hey, stop, this is not for you. You're bypassing uh, the national and the regional level. It, it, are you really getting the support uh, from the countries or uh, are there different attitudes towards your suggestions or? Um, I think what we are talking about has always been achieved through national governments uh, with the delegations in the lead, European delegations in different countries. So what I can just cite is that in several countries we have very positive uh, perspectives for developing territorial approaches or developing territorial perspective. Particularly, this, particularly for example, I'm, uh, comes to mind uh, Colombia, where um, the peace process and the Solving a protracted crisis uh, problem and the problem of inequality, uh, the government is staying fully behind this, or at least the previous government, and then automatically they came to uh, installing territorial uh, policies or territorial development policies. So in several countries we see that the, let's say that the governments themselves are seeing, uh, are taking this territorial perspective much more, um, even to translate it in policies and in instruments, uh, as, as the only way to solve a lot of uh, issues with marginalized uh, uh, regions or uh, in conflict situations. So I think, uh, yes, we are just partnering up with governments and perspectives are looking good in several countries and, and in other regions it's more difficult. Um, but we have concrete examples because the Commission has been working through its investments and its programs uh, for many years already sometimes taking a ter ter territorial perspective without knowing it, so we will do something <laughs> on this. Oh. Okay, you can keep that microphone. We, we all are independent here with different technologies. Uh, Jordan, from an FAO perspective, would you, would you share uh, his perspective? Uh, or um, do you have different experiences? So is the territorial approach um, and maybe the integrated landscape management approach. Are those things which are easy to sell uh, when you talk to governments um, and you? Uh, I think, well, I think, I, I think yeah. this is going up, okay. Um, there are a number of challenges. So as, as, we, as we all know that um, both in terms of how FEO functions as well as with our national counterparts, we, the, the, the status quo and the, the general approach is generally a, a sectoral one. Um, but I think there is, as was mentioned, a general consensus that that approach is, is not working. Um, so I think that, but figuring out how to move forward is, is the devil's in the details, of course. Um, this methodology that I presented the PNTD is a flexible one, and we have adapted it to a number of different contexts to try to tailor it to the needs and and, and challenges at different territories. So we have used this um, working with indigenous communities. Uh, we've worked on it to address gender challenges, uh, working with internally displaced uh, peoples. Um, we've worked with it in, in East Africa within pastoralism contexts. Um, 
so there, we, we've, we've tried to be flexible to, to, to be adaptive to, to new challenges. Um, particularly relevant, we found this to be in, in, in Africa, where we're working uh, in a post-colonial context where a number of borders um, are causing, uh, causing problems from that colonial history. Uh, we also see that climate change is exacerbating, exacerbating uh, these challenges, um, leading to migration. Um, in a number of different contexts. So we work uh, primarily in Africa, but increasingly also in Central and South Asia. Um, Latin America has a strong history in territorial approaches, okay. especially at the national government right. level. Maybe post-colonial is an interesting word which gets you two together. Um, but also, I found interesting how you both described territory. And uh, I think, Jordan, you said territories are socio-political arenas. Um, and uh, also, Jean-Michel, you said, I think territories are spaces of governance. So it's not putting on a map and drawing boundaries. It is about something that is a very dynamic uh, process. Um, any, any comments? Do you, do you think... Um, no, it's a question of power balance also, and it's a question of all the people acting together and gathering together for a, for, for a project in their lives, and I think that's the... Maybe you have this experience uh, from New Caledonia. Could you <laughs> maybe say a few words why this kind of approach you think is helpful in a transition uh, period where independence and stronger... Uh, empowerment of the native community. Well, it, it's a bit difficult to speak of New Caledonia in two minutes, even if it's a very small <laughs> area. <laughs> but the question was the question of decolonization, in fact, from uh, from, from from a country from France, uh, of course, and from the, the the way two communities, white communities, coming from colonization and uh, autonomous people, uh, autochthon people, the Kanak people, are living all together and have to share uh, the space. <laughs> An island on an archipel in the in the past. So in that case, uh, if you look at sectors, um, you, you you cannot tackle the real political things. You have to speak about what's the the, the sharing of the, the different community of their land and how they can move uh, all together. So in that perspective, uh, really the, the the local authorities there had to implement it to institutionalize uh, the territorial development program in order to catch this question. And it was the political issue at the beginning how to make people live together. But after that, it's a question also. Uh, they, they have mines, they have nickel in, uh, in New Caledonia, which is the first reserve of nickel in the world. And they are also to tackle this question of uh, who is managing the, ni the nickel, who is, who is uh, doing, and, and what's the connection between the nickel and, uh, and, and agriculture. And so in that perspective also, and it's the case in, in several places in the world, in that perspective, when you have political issues and this question of uh, natural resource management in a small territories, then territories uh, development is quite uh, necessary, I think. It's, uh, I see Sarah nodding. Uh, <laughs> maybe, Sarah, you want to, to add to, to that observation. What I found really interesting, you, you went in even further uh, in describing not territory but landscapes, landscapes as a socio-cultural process um, uh, or socio-ecological uh, process. I think, well, interesting point. W w why only ecological? No, why no, not cultural socio-cultural? Uh, yeah. <laughs> do not these two things have to go together? Maybe could you elaborate a bit more uh, sure. on that? Because I think that takes it a step further. A absolutely. And I think it's, it's very interesting because um, when people come now and ask who are embarking on these initiatives, these mul complex multi-stakeholder initiatives, um, one of the things that I've learned is to move away from like the scientific explanation of why you should do things. I did start off as a researcher. I'm a recovering researcher, right? Um, but it is actually about building on that identity of place. It is ex do the culture work all the really successful integrated landscape management initiatives I've done, it's that somehow they are all fighting about everything. They're arguing there's just so many trade-offs. And the way our world is set up right now, it, it, it forces trade-offs on us. And territorial development for me is shifting from a relationship of these different sectors and different places from a trade-off mentality to a synergies mentality. It's an innovation approach. 
it, it's definitely moving you from the status quo to innovation. But that work is hard and it's, it's, a, it's a slog. And it is the cultural and the identity issues that people say, we want this place to be beautiful also for our children. We want to restore water security in our region. We want to support, and that is actually the glue that keeps, keeps folks together. Um, and I think, I think it's really that, that emphasis. I, I think it's really important to say that it's, uh, I think to build on what you were saying, is it's the territorial or landscape approach isn't about just, just adding to what the sectors are doing because that, people hear that sometimes and they say, oh, it's gonna be even more complicated. It's actually about overcoming the, in the, the trade-offs in the current system and finding s solutions for them that will produce multiple benefits, produce all of the SDGs in every landscape. And I think that challenge is, is really the one to take, yeah. Sarah, sorry to interrupt no. you. Uh, I see that Stefan Smith has an important meeting. Maybe we give him a hand of applause because in the beginning we were... Uh, <laughs> he really is a key figure who enables us to have meetings like this uh, <laughs> and he will take on the messages although he's leaving the room. It's not because of... Uh, disinterest, I think. Uh, sorry I interrupted you, but no, 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 uh, I think was, you got the, the message yeah. across. Uh, the issue of identity, I mean, in a very European or even Northern perspective, there are the wrong people who think they are in charge of identity. So really we should not allow them uh, to capture it and we should really encourage people who have a positive, future-oriented way of looking at identity as a driver and organizing principle uh, for our development. Right, and I actually, I just wanted to, to emphasize the point that was made by my fellow speakers here. I, I, that you're, you're right about the caution and the use of that term. It really is um, what, what we see as the core basic activity that needs to happen with integrated landscape management. We, we have a sort of a five level circle. It's a, an adaptive collaborative management model. But the first thing is to get a shared understanding among landscape, among people in the landscape as to what is actually going on, because people tend to have a very myopic, I don't know if you've seen that picture with the blind man and the elephant, and you know, one thinks that, that, that an elephant is like a snake because they have the tail, and another one thinks the elephant is like a big fan because they've got the ear. That is m normal in, in every place that I've ever seen. And so you need a process of, of collaborative assessment before you start planning at all, where people just get what's going on. They see the demographic trends, they see these things, and they say, ah, this is what's going on in our landscape. And then the second phase is coming to a collaborative vision about where we want to go. And that needs to be a vision that grabs stakeholders across the landscape. And that's more what I meant in terms of identity. It's like, what do we want this place to look like? What are we proud of? What aspects of that pride do we want to make sure are happening across? The third element is then getting into the design uh, of, of the interventions, and the, the fourth is to implement and get financing for them, and the fifth is, is monitoring that feeds then to this whole collaborative exercise into are we moving in the direction we want to go in this landscape, or do we need to make some changes in the approaches that we're taking? Okay, a good moderator is one that uh, manages to end a meeting in time. So in five minutes, I'm supposed to close this, but I decide that if you agree, we go over for 15 minutes. Hopefully not another group will enter this room. Uh, if that's okay, then we can open it. But before, uh, <coughs> maybe I wanted to give... I will need to leave in, in 10 minutes. Okay, you have to leave in 10 yeah. minutes. So, um, but uh, <coughs> maybe a, a quick uh, last comment because I see he has such a long list of things he would <laughs> like to get across. No, Patrick. No, I'm just thinking of from, from previous speakers. I mean, we are all agreed that, that um, this multi-stakeholder-led uh, processes at different scales and so on, leading to cross-sectoral approaches and implementing it. And then also the objective of having a strategic approach that really addresses spatial and sectoral coordination issues, that is at the core of territorial approaches. What I would li like to add is also that the territorial approach takes in account the structural evolutions like uh, Jean-Michel is, is telling about or, or uh, trying to investigate or anticipate on, on rural transformation, rural urban integration, uh, on, on these observations that we commonly make that, okay, rural areas are deserted, but it's not true. So looking at really the structural transformation side 
and then also vulnerabilities, both in cities and in rural areas. I mean, these things are also linked. We don't have to think landscapes only in terms of rural areas. I think it's also this rural-urban continuum that we have to consider. So it, it's, it is, let's say, yeah, okay, we have to think broader probably than just rural in this case also. Yeah. So this is... Uh, yeah, thank you for bringing in the, the rural-urban linkages issue. Um, and uh, I think the long list of issues we could go on uh, discussing, I think, is clear. Um, now it's your turn. We have limited time. If you have short comments and questions to the podium, I know it's difficult. We need an icebreaker. Um, yeah. Thanks. <laughs> if you could just... The microphone is coming. Philip is bringing the microphone, and uh, if you could tell us where you come from and to whom you address your question, maybe you can get up, st stand okay, up. So, um, Anja Gassner from the World Agroforestry Center, and the question is actually to the entire panel. Um, coming just from Sharm El Sheikh from the Biodiversity yeah. COP, where mainstreaming of biodiversity obviously is a, was a huge topic, especially for the post-2020 agenda. Now, listening to all of you, um, one of the things that basically came out is if we do not have dedicated financing at a national level for cross-sectorial activities and outcomes, mm. then it's very unlikely that this is going to happen. So having like four leading institutions with a huge influence on development directions sitting in front. So what is your take on that to support or insensitize national governments to have that budget in place. Thank you. Although Sarah is not the person that disseminates a lot of money, but you're funding uh, also important projects, but since you may have to leave, I would like you to answer first, and uh, FAO and EU Commission may have time to think about where the money comes from. Sure, no, this has been an issue that's been very, very much on our minds at Eco Agriculture Partners and in the broader landscape through People Food and Nature Initiative. I be personally believe that if we're serious about this, it is going to, it's going to require a, a change in the way that financing is done toward um, these, these kinds of, mo both towards supporting the platforms directly institutionally that to, to help mobilize these kinds of stakeholder processes, but also more importantly that the kinds of investments that are done are these multi-objective investments, whether it's how you build a road so it's designed in such a way that it doesn't mess up the biodiversity in the region to how we do agricultural d development. So I think, it, first of all, 90% of money is, na is, is national. Don't look to the international community. That's not where the most of the money is going to come from. Don't look for the national government for most of the money. It should be catalytic funding that's supporting these territorial development processes. I think we need to strengthen the capacities of local governments to do this kind of work. That's the obvious place to make most of this kind of work. But I also want to emphasize that most of the money in the world is not public. It's actually private. And the value of these multi-stakeholder processes, if you can involve the private sector fruitfully in these conversations and strategies so that they also design their own investments in ways that move towards these objectives, they all commit to biodiversity-friendly elements in all of the private investments that are being done as well. I think that's the kind of really shifting to a green economy that we need to be thinking of, and I see this territorial development as the, the major sort of strategy we can pursue to get to, to a green economy. So I, I think there's a lot of innovation to be done. Yeah. Thank you. I think that's encouraging. It's not only about money, uh, but... Uh, it's about redeploying not, money in different not ways. Not a traditional way of... Yeah. You don't, what you don't want to have is the situation we see in almost all the landscapes that we work and advise in. They are so excited. They've got actually a billion dollars of new money to do a sustainable development. But if you do an analysis of financial flows, there's $99 billion going into that landscape for unsustainable things. So. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. Comment FAO or EU, or you agree with Sarah? <laughs> uh, I, I think the good points made by Sarah for sure, and it's certainly a, a challenge. Um, uh, for sure. Uh, the, the Angolan case that I presented, we were able to integrate that into a larger uh, program working with other Francophone countries, uh, uh, for example, um, Mozambique. 
uh, also working with Brazil. And I think that national governments are increasingly recognizing that uh, best practices um, and lessons learned from other contexts can be applied and adapted to, to their home countries and actually strengthen the implementation of these, of these uh, national programs. So I think there is a growing awareness that um, working across borders and with other countries can, can bring benefits. But um, most of our work is with, with public funding. Uh, but I think that they're, I think it's complex, but it's certainly uh, uh, important to engage with the, with the private sector as well. Patrick, yeah. very brief. Just briefly, I mean, we're looking at uh, 36 projects that have uh, some of the principles that are mentioned in the paper uh, that look like territorial approaches. As I said in the beginning, we're not sure if we're doing the right things, but okay, anyway. Of these 36 processes, which were multi-stakeholder, territorial space-based processes, we, we, we saw that an average amount of money invested through the, uh, through the uh, TILD approach was about 1.2 million. So it's not a huge amount of money that you need to trigger those stakeholder or multi-stakeholder processes at local level. What is needed is then setting the framework so that the private sector can direct its, its investments and so we get all on the same paper, all the same on the same objectives. That is the challenge. That's why I mentioned also this distribution between what are the goods that we want to produce in the territory. Are they common goods are they, or are they better produced by the public sector or are they better produced by the private sector? These trades off are at the core of these multi-sector uh, stakeholder processes. So you don't need a huge amount of money to do it, mm -hmm. but then you have to ask the right questions when you do, and, and then you probably can direct uh, the private funding uh, in the right direction. That's the hope we have anyway. Exactly. Uh, Jean-Michel, I wanted to, to bring you in. Maybe you, you add to this and maybe you use the opportunity also to have uh, a, a brief word on the white paper you've been oh. involved in preparing because I'm afraid that will be your last chance. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> so about finance, I think, and from the research perspective, I think it's, uh, we have to work on um, evaluation of uh, the, the, the advantages of this uh, kind of approach because uh, it's much more easy to, uh, it's easier to, to, to count the, the value added in the value chain, for instance, and so on. That's uh, to, to show how uh, territorial perspective facilitate and enhance uh, economic development. So we need, uh, Sarah told about this, but I think we need to work on this and to work on the, the evaluation and to have good metrics uh, to show that to, to convince. And we have to insist also on, uh, from the agricultural perspective, for instance, the agroecologization agro of the agriculture, it's very difficult to say, but <laughs> it's, it's on. Well, the battle is not won at all. The battle will be long and so on, but we, we all feel that the, the eco eco ecological process in agriculture will be enhanced in the, in, in the future, have to be enhanced. And this, bring back territorial perspective also in the, in the game because it's uh, small networks and uh, local-based agriculture that, should, that is to be encouraged. So we have to, to show that the stakes uh, is in uh, this territorial perspective. Demographic push, I, I talk about this. I think it's really essential to show this and to, uh, to, uh, to insist that on this. And, uh, and with all these kind of elements, uh, we should promote this kind of, uh, this kind of, of, uh, of, of approach. I think it's uh, the future also that brings this, this uh, kind of approach in, uh, in, in the field and research are things to do for that. And talking about the, the, the paper, uh, this idea is that all these institutions there, uh, including the research, including also SARA, including also the REMIFS uh, network in, uh, in Latin America and all the partners, we all think that really um, territorial perspective is important to, to, to share. And we all feel that this, this question of uh, difficulties to, uh, for an agency, for national governments and so on, to, they just say, well, perhaps it's too complicated, perhaps it's too, so we have to, we've decided to show that it's not so complicated like this, and we, and we try to advocate for this kind of, uh, of, uh, of, of approach and perspective. So we publish all together this kind of document, and we want to use this kind of document to, uh, to make advocacy and to share and, and to, go to, 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 to go for that. So it's the first step, uh, uh, but I think it's going to, I hope it's going to be fruitful and that we, go, we can go on with it on, uh, in the future. So I invite you to read this paper and, uh, and to participate to the yeah. advocacy with us. Okay, I'm afraid the, the, we risk erosion here now. Uh, please give a hand to, to Sarah, she is... Uh, <coughs>
and actually to the entire panel, because I'm afraid we will have to close. Um, since uh, Stefan Schmitz is unable to do the wrap-up, um, he asked me if I could try. I mean, difficult task. Uh, I have made some scribbled notes. I think we had really an interesting discussion, so thanks to uh, the speakers and uh, you as a panelist. Um, integrated landscape management must be part of a territorial approach, and that is not in opposition to sectoral approaches, but sectoral approaches can only be successful if they are complemented by uh, a territorial perspective which reaches beyond the sector um, and looks beyond the silos. We're not talking about breaking up the silos. They are a reality, but people should look beyond and be able to cooperate and collaborate. So going beyond boundaries, both sectoral but also administrative, not being stuck in the traditional administrative boundaries. And I think the conceptualization of territory we heard was uh, clearly not the traditional one which follows, let's say, administrative delineations. It is more looking at the potential, uh, not only at the problems of areas, and the potential that people and places have. People in terms of the actors, what are the actors you have to bring to the table? So it must be and will be multi-stakeholder uh, processes and getting the communication going is a real challenge. And uh, so this place-based approach is important and it will gather people around a vision, but we had a chancellor here just next door who said, well, if you have visions, go to the doctor, uh, <coughs> because uh, I don't believe in visions. Yes, visions have to be translated uh, into actual uh, steps, how you get the things done and um, put into reality. And that has a lot to do in the multi-stakeholder process then with participation and maybe not only participation, but going a step further in order to organize partnerships where people work together. And uh, so you end up with a lot of multis, uh, multi-sectoral, multi-stakeholder, multi-sector, um, but also multi-level. Uh, this traditional issue, is it either top-down or bottom-up? Uh, we need actually both. We need the bottom-up initiative, but that needs to be enabled, and there is an important task from the top to provide the appropriate framework conditions for that, and we need to make sure that the local and landscape approach is not an anecdotal one uh, experience, but that people and regions can learn from each other uh, so this peer learning, which I think was in the presentation of Sarah, very obvious, is also encouraging people by learning how other uh, people in different regions, territories, um, and landscapes approach things. So the networking of initiatives, I think, is important. So this all comes to the issue which Stefan Schmitz at the beginning highlighted very strongly it's about good rural governance. And uh, you may remember, I'm not sure I recollect all the five. Uh, <coughs> it was not just decentralization, but it was one important element. It was empowering the local communities. I see the person who for sure was involved in the different uh, sub-elements of good rural governance. Boris, w you want to add the other ones? <laughs> So with that, uh, you've seen one of the key figures behind this whole exercise here, and it's uh, Ms. Jacobi. Uh, they are both from GIZ. Uh, their logo is missing here, but if you know the German setting, um, then behind BMZ, the real machine is GIZ. I also see uh, here another important rural uh, development champion from GIZ with uh, Vele Molonga. Um, so really 
we cannot go on here on the panel, but use the opportunity if you have still a bit of time for further bilateral exchanges. I think uh, very early Saturday morning, um, it was still worth getting up early. Thank you very much. Thanks also to the technicians in the back who made sure that our mics and uh, speakers were on. I think it was a good start. You have another two days. So in that positive spirit, uh, let's move on. Thanks a lot.